Hello, hello, amigos. Good evening. Hi, everyone. Welcome to this new series of tours from home about the greatest mysteries of Peru. Thank you so much for coming and also for your support. We're going to talk about one of the mysteries of Peru tonight. And with this musical background of the X-Files that uh, became such a boom, right? I remember in the 90s, early 2000s, it was also one of my favorite series. And tonight, well, I am making one of my dreams come true, which is talking about the mysteries of Peru. So thanks a lot for your participation, my friends. My name is Vanessa Vasquez. I am your Lima City Guide. And this is a new series that we are starting tonight. This is, by the way, the repetition of a event that I did last Wednesday, also earlier in the day. So if you're coming again for a second occasion, well, you're going to be able to hear again the story analyze it with me as well. I'm trying to do these events two times a week, so in that way you will not miss the opportunity. Uh, doesn't matter if you are in a part of the world where maybe the time cannot be convenient in the first event. I'm going to put our slide now and uh, we're going to have the chance tonight to discover uh, and to learn about one of the mysteries of Peru uh, is a recent mystery, uh, to be honest. It came, became part of the news uh, in Peru and around the world uh, a few years ago in 2017. And it still is something fresh, right? So, but the story that, that, that gave sort of like the origin to this, to this um, mystery is quite old, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, so in most of these events about mysteries of Peru, we're going to talk about archeology, span about things that cannot be easily um, described or understand it or explain. Uh, uh, and sometimes we have to go uh, to alternative explanations also uh, to, to try to give a, a profound uh, explanation. Right? And tonight we are going to talk about the alien mummies of Peru, right? Also known as the alien mummies of Nazca. Mm -hmm. uh, so in, in future occasions, when you're going to see again this, um, this event published on Hago, uh, we're going to be talking about different mysteries. So every time is going to be something different. Every week we have this event, we're going to talk about different mysteries. Let me know if you have uh, any any special request uh, in the comments or at the end of the event, please. That would be super fantastic for me to know what uh, is, is the, the, what are the things that you would like to hear from me uh, in next occasions. Also, some recommendations hmm, uh, for uh, maybe going for forward with your uh, own investigation because I would like to you to use these opportunities as sort of like a little window or little little door opening into new topics mm -hmm. um, I will be giving you some recommendations on videos that you can find in YouTube uh, in the case of these videos they are in Spanish but also you can activate subtitles in in them for example uh, we have a, a documentary you, that you can find in YouTube about the mummies of Nazca or uh, the Peruvian alien mummies uh, created by the History Channel Latin America mm? <laughs> the Nazca lines are no worries, Rhonda. Yes, 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 of course. We're going to talk about the Nazca lines, no worries. It's going to be also very soon. Uh, so uh, you have this uh, video in YouTube. And also you have <laughs> the uh, um, response uh, from a more scientific uh, perspective of this theme uh, in, in all the videos, the one I chose that I consider to be a very good summatory of 12 minutes about it is the Gran Estafa of the Mummies of Nazca. Uh, so 
in today's event, I want to talk about the perspectives of people who believed the mummies of Nazca that we're going to be talking about are alien. And also we're going to understand the perspective of scientists, uh, archaeologists that consider this to be uh, a fraud, right? So we're going to try to understand both perspectives today, okay? So first of all, uh, we're going to locate ourselves in the place, in the part of the world where the finding of these mummies took place. Uh, so this is Peru, this is my country. We are located uh, in the uh, in a territory that is considered the central Andes of South America. We are next to the Pacific Ocean. We are also part of, of our country in the Andes and part of it is in the, in the jungle, the Amazonian area. So Nazca is located in the south coast of Peru in a territory that is a desert. This is the uh, sort of like the extension of the Atacama Desert. Uh, all of this desert over here uh, is created by the Humboldt Current, uh, the cold current of Humboldt that comes from the south, that comes from the uh, Antarctic. So this territory over here, Nazca, is a desert where rains less than one cubic centimeter every decade. It's a dry, dry desert. Oh, Lazara, thanks for coming. Thank you, thank you. So this location here, uh, also notice uh, over here, Nazca, uh, a, a little bit more uh, like a, as a zoom, right? Is located about 449 kilometers away from Lima. Uh, it is a long bus ride from Lima to this territory and is more famous as a place uh, of archeology, span but especially a place where gigantic lines are located, called the Nazca Lines. So the coast of Peru was a very fertile location in terms of archaeology, in terms of ancient societies. We had different cultures developed in different eras in my country. And in this location in particular, there were different cultures. The most famous is the Nazca culture that receives the name uh, of the location of the city, Nazca. Mm -hmm. So the pre-Hispanic societies, there are many mysteries about them. Of course, most of these events are going to be referring to pre-Hispanic mysteries. Um, many of the pre-Hispanic uh, mysteries uh, that we have in Peru, that many uh, people that are especially eager to, to create about the paranormal explanations or UFOs explanations are related with how marvelous the architecture in the pre-Hispanic was. Many people say that most of the architecture, that this megalithic architecture that was made in Peru before the coming of the conquistadors was, was so, so amazing, so huge, or that was impossible to be made with the technology uh, of, of that time. When we talk about this with archaeologists, archaeologists will definitely say, of course, no, all of these pre-Hispanic buildings were made by ancient societies with no need of external uh, or let's say extraterrestrial help, right? So I just want to be very clear. Uh, archaeologists have a position and also ufologists, people that believe in UFOs, have a different position. But they are mysteries. For example, notice in these elements, in these decorative elements, uh, which were part of fabrics or potteries, uh, these characters that have three fingers, right? So you can see here, several of these uh, characters with three fingers or three toes, uh, very, very unusual. This has also called the attention of, uh, of the years of uh, ex ex experts and, and um, people that are uh, inclined to believe that there were certain type of connections with uh, beings from out of space, right? Uh, also, another idea uh, that uh, they they believe, no, it's, it's connected with this uh, extraterrestrial presence is the fact that many of the uh, people in the pre-Hispanic times, for example, used to um, deform their skulls to make the loom may they look elongated. Uh, these are, by the way, uh, uh, pictures of mummies. Uh, in this case, for example, this uh, a mummy that still has 
hair, right, attached to uh, the, the skin of, of this mummified section, segment of, of the head. Um, these curious shapes of skulls were uh, obtained after a long process uh, of deformation of their skulls that took place when these, these people were little babies. Also, oh, the uh, deformation, the skull deformations that happened in Peru were a very important part of the life of these people uh, with the intention of the mark in these human beings, the status that they were receiving or inheriting from their or say social circle, their parents, for example. The only moment in the life of a person uh, um, to receive such modification in their skull was when they were babies. Uh, so they, this deformation had to stop when they were very, very little, and it had to continue up to the second year of life uh, of this person. Uh, so they were still little children. Uh, because that's the only moment in the life of a human being when the skull is softly in the use where we uh, some type of uh, flat wooden pieces in the front, in the back, or sometimes they could be uh, cotton also put in certain locations and little by little creating pressure uh, in the front and in the back. They started to shake as if it was a play-doh, right, the skull. And the skull also, and the brain, of course, will adapt to the space given. Uh, so these deformations took a long, long period of time to be done. They had to be done with patients, and most likely they were not um, like painful for the child. Um, but definitely it caused, at some point, some mobility issues, like they were not able to uh, run or they were not able probably to, uh, let's say, uh, uh, they had some, some type of damage in their skull. There, that is, there is a probability of that. Um, but we are not very sure about that, of course, in this moment. So these forms, these peculiar forms uh, or shapes given to the skull of the individuals in the pre-Hispanic times um, respond, of course, to an idea of a status, uh, and a status inherited since birth. But for the people that are supporters of the um, alien uh, contact with pre-Hispanic societies, they believe, of course, that the, these people were imitating the, the looks of these extraterrestrial creatures. Uh, they were trying to look like them. Mm -hmm. Why would they do that, is asking Rhonda. Thank you, Rhonda, by the way. And friends, if you have a question, just let me know it here in the chat zone. Don't be shy, please. Just comment. Uh, uh, I would love to, to know your question. So Rhonda is commenting, why would they do that? Why would someone want their child to look like that? Excellent question, Rhonda. First of all, uh, and something very important also to mention uh, about this, no? the perspective of, of beauty, uh, health, like physical health, is something that uh, evolves and change, right? change over, over the time. Uh, for what is beautiful for us in this moment this is no, was not necessarily the same for even, you know, two or three generations behind us, right? Um, so just, you know, in the, in, the, in the fashion, just in the hair, haircuts or makeup, right, it changes a lot. For the pre-Hispanic people, uh, the shape of the skull, especially um, the, the, the more elevation, the biggest elevation, uh, the elongation of the skull was related with a status, right? Um, because also the idea that at someone had the bigger skull that could not perform certain works, you know, like plugging the soul, uh, like fishing, right? Uh, you needed someone to take care of you. you know? So you were, uh, you, you were performing other types of jobs that were not manual, right? So uh, that was the idea, distinction. Also, the archaeologists believe that these deformations were a, at some point a form, a physical form to separate you from other groups. You know? um, so this is the belief. Remember, our perspective of beauty uh, changes uh, and it was definitely not the same for the people of the pre-Hispanic times. 
most likely the people of the pre-Hispanic times, especially the people of Nazca or Paracas, these people we're looking at in this moment, in these pictures, they considered this to be very beautiful, very attractive, right? And you can see examples of skull deformation in different parts of the world, my friends. Mm -hmm. So, Yes, Mark, of course, it might have been related with some uh, type of uh, royalty. Exactly. Rhonda, Egypt, uh, in North America as well. Uh, I know there were different groups, indigenous groups that deform also uh, the skulls of the babies. So this is pretty much the idea. I hope I was able to, to answer uh, clearly. Uh, uh, of course, the archaeologists just can give us some clues uh, to understand the psychology of these people. But unfortunately, we are not able to read documents made by these ancient people to understand what they were trying to, to symbolize with this. But uh, as we are talking about the mysteries of Peru, so it's important to understand that, of course, from the first look, seeing this, these skulls, we, we imagine sometimes not the, the description of the aliens, right? So was there any contact between the ancient Peruvians with the aliens? If this is the case, if, if aliens do exist, and many people believe so, many people are investigators of this phenomenon of the alien world, well, maybe, of course, there might be some type of possibility that they were able to witness, to see oh, some phenomena happening in the sky. But also there is another interesting element here that I want to mention, just to go to the mummies, the, uh, the, the alien mummies of Nazca, which are not the ones we saw. These are completely 100% human DNA, right? That there's, those are not aliens. The alien mummies are coming in a moment. So what we're seeing here is the, uh, are some of the famous Nazca lines. The Nazca lines are also located in the side where the alien mummies came from, uh, are these gigantic drawings that extend for, uh, in, in a section of kilometers of, of wide. Uh, and these um, lines, which sometimes are uh, 50 meters long, they go up to 100 meters long, so they are huge. They represent images uh, of animals. Most of the cases, those are animals. Then sometimes we have also geometrical forms, like, for example, trapezoids or triangles, like you see over here, which are just randomly located in a big desert uh, plateau. Um, so the most curious thing about these lines is that they are all so big that it's impossible to see them when you are next to them, right? So you need to be in a high elevation on top of a mountain or on the skies to see these lines well. That's why they were discovered basically in the 20th century when the first commercial flights happened in Peru and the planes started to pass across this section and from the air the aviators started to see lines in the desert you know, in nowhere in the middle of nowhere so this is how the lines were dis rediscovered right so uh, why they were made looking to the skies uh, the uh, supporters of the theories uh, of the contact of, of ancient Peruvians with, you know, extraterrestrials say that uh, there was uh, probably a, an intention of the local people, the indigenous people, to uh, contact them or to send them messages. Archaeologists today were talking about both opinions, of course. Uh, I want to be fair. Archaeologists believe that there was no, no necessity of them to connect with extraterrestrials, but they were trying to connect with the gods, the deities up there in the sky, the sun, the moon, the stars. Huh? So that's why they were looking, they were pointing these drawings in that direction and possibly asking messages uh, uh, to them or, or asking uh, that maybe water, for example, or, or some climatic changes. So that's why they were trying to connect with these deities. But also, there are archaeologists that believe that they were not necessarily trying to send messages uh, like uh, to, to deities out there in the, in the skies. What they were trying to, to do is using these designs as a uh, sort of like as, um, a, 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 a place for ceremonies, a place where they danced, 
Uh, so because uh, something very curious is that when you start the drawing, the line of the drawing, the point when you start is the same point when the line ends. Also, uh, it's always like that uh, in all of the drawings. Uh, the point where you start, you know, to, to, to do the line, right, is the same point when the line ends, right? So it seems that this was sort of like a circuit uh, where these ancient people used to dance uh, because also it has been discovered that in the section where the lines are, which are carved lines on the desert, there was um, some more compression in the floor. It means that these people dance a step over these lines consecutively for thousands of times and that's how the soil compacted more just in that location and this was also measured with scanners right so this is how nowadays we believe that these lines were used as a, as a circuit for dancing over them so now I'm going to go to the mummies in, in particular because we understand now that why there is this belief in Peru about a possibility that the pre-Hispanic societies had a connection, uh, some type of uh, relation with aliens, with uh, entities from out of space, right? Um, and this is, by the way, something very well defined in Peru. Uh, of course, there are nowadays, you know, less and less people that believe in, in these theories and are more um, inclined to the scientific uh, theories and explanations. But uh, still, we have lots of people that believe about these connections uh, between the ancient Peruvians and the aliens. And the story of today, the story of the alien mummies of Nazca, it starts with this person or uh, with this um, character. Yes, Ron, of course, and I'm creating these events for you as well, for all of you. And I want you to have the chance of learning from these mysteries. And at the end of these events, I want you to have your own conclusions about this. Mm -hmm. So we have Leandro Rivera. Leandro Rivera uh, is a miner of profession, but as well, he is a waquero, even syndicated as part of a, a gang, a group uh, of waqueros. What is a waquero? Waquero is the a Tom Rider is a is a, um, a a person who is dedicated to steal uh, objects from tombs, from pre-Hispanic tombs, right, and selling those uh, objects uh, to the higher bidder. So um, this person, Leandro Rivera, is the most important character of our story. He is going to be known from now on as. Mario, because this is his alias. That's the way how he presents uh, when he uh, also deals with this um, story of the of the mummies and the products. Also, he um, has obtained it uh, for a, for this uh, story, right? So, so besides Mario, we have another important character in this story: is Thierry Jamin. Thierry Jamin. Uh, he lives in Peru nowadays. He was not born in Peru. He was born in France. And he uh, came to Peru in 1998 to find the lost city of Paititi. Paititi is a mythological city that was um, uh, described in chronicles of the uh, Spanish, of the conquistadors. And this lost city of Paititi was supposed to be in the jungle and was a city covered with gold and silver. And many conquistadors tried to find out where was Paititi. Many even never returned. Uh, they went to, to find it. They never returned. Uh, they disappeared. They were swallowed by the jungle. So for many, many, uh, um, let's say hundreds of years, uh, many people tried to find it. And uh, Terry Jamin uh, also tried to find Paititi. He was not able to do it, but he got in love of Peru and he decided to stay in this country. He lives in Cusco and he created a, a non-governmental organization that is called 
Incarri. By the way, later I'm going to share with you the website of Incarri for you to get to understand a little bit more about the job of this person and what Incarri has done in Peru. So uh, he is dedicated, committed to protect archaeological sites uh, that are sort of like new uh, discoveries, but especially he gives more a uh, paranormal uh, alternative, uh, sort of like uh, more uh, inclusive line to alien um, uh, sort of like scientific uh, perspective or support or investigation to these sites okay hola sayuri <laughs> hola amiga thanks for coming so um, if you wish to know more about incari and what they do remember a little bit ahead in this event i'm going to share with you the website of this site so why this person is important in our story because uh, Mario, you know, Leandro Medina, Mario, uh, he contacted Thierry Jamin because he knew uh, about his particular interest in these um, elements that are uh, sort of like paranormal, right? So uh, he contacted him and showed him the mummies he had in his possession, which were product of his sacking, his looting. Uh, remember that in Peru, looting is completely illegal. It's an illegal activity, right? So we are also getting in, in a very, very dirty field or ground, right? So that's going to come later. Uh, so, <laughs> no worries, Ayuri, no worries. So we have um, here some pictures of the mummies that uh, Mario, right, gave to Thierry Jamin, right? So uh, he gave several mummies. We have Alberto, uh, Alberto, Josefina, Victoria, and the family, which are three uh, individuals, are tiny, more or less 50 to 60 centimeter uh, humanoids uh, that they were given to Thierry Jamin to be investigated. We have Maria also. Maria is a full like human size, one meter sixty more or less centimeters height, uh, mummy, right? We have Wawita, which is a baby. Oh, it's a it's a small child of few months of life, right? And we have also uh, heads and hands. Mm -hmm. All of them, as you can see from first look. Uh, they have characteristics of uh, alien, right? Uh, humanoids, aliens, right? Uh, even one of them, Maria in particular, which is one of the, the most investigated mummies of the, of the lote, of the group, uh, was named, because it was a new species of, of human so far, uh, uh, Thierry Jamin uh, believed, uh, it was named this new species of human of human Jamin Palpanensis. Remember that the name of uh, this French investigator is Thierry Jamin, right? And Palpanensis because uh, the mummies were discovered in a desert called Palpa, right? So there is another third person involved in this story, and he's a famous ufologist. He's a Mexican uh, celebrity. Uh, his name is Jaime Maussan. And Jaime Maussan is, is very famous in the, in the circles in the world of the paranormal investigations and also in the UFOs investigations. He is also producer of different programs, uh, TV programs, um, videos, and he works for the international network Gaia, which is like a Netflix of the paranormal, right? Uh, so he put in contact with the uh, History Channel no, to create a, um, uh, say a documentary about this discovery, which is the one you can also see later if you wish uh, in internet. Mm -hmm. uh, we have another person in this story is a Peruvian congressman, Armando Villanueva Mercado. And uh, this congressman uh, was the only one who uh, decided to support the investigations of Thierry Jamin, Jaime Maussan, uh, and, um, and, and got interested in protecting 
the mummies, right? There is a really interesting story here, in particular, uh, about the government and their position about the finding. Mm -hmm. uh, and also, I see a question here. When were these three discovered? Discovered? Oh, do you mean, uh, Rhonda, the mummies? The mummies were discovered in 2017 by uh, by Leandro Medina, well, by Mario, but um, uh, immediately after they were discovered, uh, Mario tried to offer these mummies to different, uh, let's say, private collectors, and they mentioned about this to the Ministry of Culture. So the Ministry of Culture in 2017 got to know about the mummies, and the Ministry of Culture denounced Leandro uh, for profanation of tombs. Oh, this was a case, considered a case of profanation of tombs, and it was not considered, of course, a, something like um, paranormal or, or uh, say alien mummies. Uh, no, uh, they believe it was a profanation uh, and also a malicious um, treatment of, of mummies. Since the beginning, the Ministry of Culture Culture did not really uh, was not interested in in this case in this way, uh, so that's how later um, when uh, Congressman Arma Armando Villanueva tried to make the mummies of national interest and support and and, and try to protect the mummies, uh, when this happened, the Ministry of Culture turned its back to Armando Villanueva because already there was a case. Uh, of a profanation of tombs related with these mummies, right? So uh, it was the, the government against the government, right? It was a very, very strange case. Uh, so we are talking about a period of between 2017, 2018, uh, in which these, these mummies were in conflict, right? So, and here we're going to see, also start seeing some pictures of the mummies. By the way, these are the little humanoids, that, the ones that are approximately 60 centimeters long. Uh, and we're going also later in a moment to evaluate uh, about the mummies, parts of the mummies. We're going to understand also the position of the protectors of the mummies, the ones that believe these are alien mummies, that they have to be protected as such. And also we're going to understand the position of the, well, the government and the position of the uh, traditional archaeologists who believed that this is a fraud case. Okay, so where are the mummies kept? Excellent question, Rhonda. They are in a university, in the University of Ica. They are located in Peru. They are not located in the hands, they are not in the hands of the government because the government is not uh, like uh, buying the idea that these are alien mummies. Uh, of course, um, the, the different uh, positions and interests and perspectives about the, these mummies are so big that um, the group uh, of, for example, Thierry Jamin, Jaime Maussan, uh, uh, all the supporters of the idea that these are um, mummies from, uh, you know, aliens or hybrids of these mummies, they got into a pact, you know, uh, with the university saying that we are going to give you the mummies, but you should not give these mummies to the government. So they are now the keepers, but they are here in Peru. In a moment also, we're going to check on the DNA tests, uh, and you can do so, Rhonda and my friends, in the websites that I'm going to be giving you in a moment, okay? So it will take time, of course, because the documents are many. I am today trying to do a summatory of, of the highlights of the discoveries of the findings about the mummies. This is, by the way, the mummy, a picture of the mummy Maria, also from the documentary of the History Channel. Mm -hmm. And the first element you can notice in the mummy is the clear fact that we have three fingers, right, and not five in her hand, and also three toes in her feet, which are very, very long, unusually long. Also, these very long skulls you see over here, and, and some very strange features in, in her face, right? But this um, person uh, was... Uh, one meter sixty, uh, so it was a uh, let's say regular size uh, person uh, or, or uh, you know entity. 
right? Um, and here a close up about this, uh, the mummy. Huh? Um, so when we look at the mummies, the humanoids, the little ones, and also the other mummies, the bigger ones, uh, immediately the first impression is of something really amazing, no? of, of a entity as the ones described, you know, like our uh, aliens. But now we're going to proceed with the analysis of the mummies. And the analysis of the mummies were done uh, by different sources, my friends. We have the analysis done by the very Thierry Jamin uh, and the group, you know, created by, with Jaime Maussan, Thierry Jamin, supporters also of the alien, uh, let's say, theory uh, uh, that are in different parts of the world. Some of these DNAs were made in Russia, in the United States. You can also dig in all of this information because it's public, is of public use in the website of the alien, it was uh, the alien project. So I'm going to share with you in a moment the links, okay? Uh, but also some uh, scientists and, and archeologists that are against this theory, uh, uh, they have done their own investigations using mummies that were previously sold, because there were some that were sold before going to uh, oh, this last group that went to Thierry Jamin, oh, there were more, huh? there were more. They were not just these eight, more or less, that we were able to see in the beginning. There were several more, and those others ended up in private, you know, hands. And there were some of these owners, uh, they were interested in offering these mummies to archaeologists, and they have done their own investigations with those other, right? They come from the same group. So we can possibly see that there, there is at some point some possibilities of connections between all of the mummies because they came from the same source, right? So we have over here the X-rays of Maria, right? So, and we're going, Rhonda, we're going to analyze all of that too. Also, all the color of the skin, we're going to analyze everything, okay? So it's coming in a moment. So here we can see, first of all, that with the x-rays, Maria, Maria, the first mommy we're talking about, uh, she has, uh, no worries, Rhonda, no worries. <laughs> so we, she has the bone structure of her face is a regular bone structure, is regular human bone structure, okay? So there's really no difference. And remember that the deformation of the skull, archaeologists can explain as also something, a practice that happened in the pre-Hispanic times. Do you remember the pictures we saw in the beginning? So it's not something that could be, you know, unusual in the pre-Hispanic times, right? Uh, so maybe, you know, this section here, right, the, of the face, um, you know, it's understandable that if we're talking about a hybrid, uh, let's say, uh, entity, you know, it could be also human, uh, uh, like looks. But I think that people, uh, most people are interested in the fingers, right, in the, in the hands. Mm -hmm. uh, but also we have to talk about the DNA because the DNA is also very important. And here, for the people that are supporters of the idea that this is a sort of like mixed entity, here they hold on this percentage of Homo sapiens DNA, 31% of Homo sapiens DNA. Mm -hmm. The rest is, is not uh, clear. The rest of the DNA is not clear. Um, so for the people that are supporters of the idea that this is a new species, even look at the name of the species, it's a new species, Jamin Palpanensis, it's not an Homo sapiens, right? Um, they said, well, that this is conclusive enough to say that possibly it was a mixed uh, breed entity. What about the position of archaeologists about this? Because this can be really conclusive, just 31% Homo sapiens. Yeah? Well, the supporters of the, non-supporters, let's say, of the idea this is alien mummy, they said that this DNA could have been contaminated 
by other elements, by other uh, chemicals also, or by the, the, the ground, the soil that was around the mummy, right? So this is a, a possibility, you know? And here also another interesting detail, which the supporters of the idea that these are extraterrestrial um, uh, say entities, 19% higher capacity, cranial capacity, than humans, uh, regular humans. Mm -hmm. um, but also remember that we, the archaeologists, believed that this could be possible if you know you deform the skull, right? Like in the case of the first mummies we saw. Okay, so again, I'm trying to give you both different perspectives. Mm -hmm. Here we have also the x-rays of the body of Maria. Look at the, uh, let's, let's go from here to here, right? From this one first. And also notice that these are the official x-rays done by the Incari Institute, which is the one that supports the idea of the alien origin of these mummies, okay? So, and they, it's in the public domain. You can, you can see these x-rays. So we can see again oh, the, um, the, the skull. First, let's go to the skull. So there's nothing unusual in terms of the skull, oh, uh, similar to any other. Uh, also, we can see that there are some missing uh, teeth, of course, uh, possibly related with the age of the mummy. This is a female mummy. Uh, in this section, we have also some uh, elements uh, connected with a poor health conditions, some of the bones, uh, there's a deterioration in the bones also, showing probably uh, a poor uh, health condition uh, in, in this mummy. Mm. And here we have the most interesting part of the mummy, which is the three uh, toes sorry, in each feet. Okay, later we're going to analyze the position of these um, of these toes, but I want you to first have a chance to see them clearly. So this is how they look inside. So they are not car cardboard. There are bones inside. There are bones inside, right? Uh, and we can see, of course, uh, like a long, long uh, three tongues, unusual, of course, le length for, uh, you know, any, any living creature, uh, especially, well, humans, right? Did they have fingerprints? Yes, Rhonda. They, they were able to find a couple of fingerprints in, in these uh, mummies because there is skin also in these mummies. Even some of the, the individuals have skin that looks very like um, allied to a sort of like uh, reptiles. Mm -hmm. So we will also talk about this in a little while. Mm -hmm. So uh, here you can see the fingers. Mm -hmm. um, initially, Maria had three toes, or it's her toes, three toes uh, in each uh, finger, in this feet, but she eventually ended up losing one of them. Later, um, well, I will offer you an explanation of possibly why one of these toes fell, right? Fell off. Okay, so... Then we have, we're just getting first to know the mummies, okay? And then I'm going to go with the uh, more explanations about the mummies. We have wawita. Wawita uh, is a Quechua word that means child, baby. Uh, so wawa is a baby. So wawita is a little baby. So we have wawita. Wawita also shares same characteristics with Maria, uh, three fingers, right? We have also uh, a deformed skull, right? And also three toes. Hmm? When we get deeper to see the skeleton of Wawita, we get to see again uh, a, a complete bone structure inside uh, the baby. Hmm? Uh, and we see that it's pretty much like regular baby uh, inside. Of course, with the only exception of the fingers and toes. Uh, here are the details. Uh, for example, Wawita has 25% Homo sapiens DNA. Mm -hmm. So we have even less. Mm -hmm. uh, 
once again, remember that there is a belief based on the percentage of DNA, human DNA low uh, that supports the idea of the alien procedence of this um, origin of these mummies. Mm -hmm. But this is not completely conclusive for archaeologists. This is mm, not a reason to believe these are alien because they believe there could be there could be DNA contaminated and that's why there is such low percentage of Homo sapiens DNA. And they say that just because there is a little bit of human DNA, they are human. Uh, that's what they say. Okay, so you you will at the end have your own conclusions, right? So we continue with the three fingers hands and feet, uh, but also, uh, and here this is official from the website of the alien project, uh, probably mutilated, probably mutilated. Uh, so we have here something not conclusive about the fingers yet, uh, but we are starting to see this element there in, in suspense. We're going to put it there in suspense. It was a baby of six or, or eight months age. Mm -hmm. And once again, we have also a bigger cranial capacity, 19% greater, bigger than regular humans of that age. Mm -hmm. We have also other uh, interesting case. We have the hands. They were also discovered, or oh, sorry, came part of the, of the group, uh, of the lote, of the group of the mummies, eight hands that were separated from the rest of the of the mummies. We don't know where the mummies are. Uh, are regular size hands, uh, like uh, bones of, of regular hands, but longer, right? So the person that had those hands must have been also same height of regular person uh, uh, nowadays. So we have here uh, this interesting detail in the... Um, the breast of this hand, uh, this metallic plaque that is incrustated in the skin, it is part of, of, the, of the skin of the mummy, right? By the way, it happened a natural mummification in these corpses, in these bodies. Uh, and this mummification is related with the element, this whitish element called diatomita. This is a duh, this is a, like a powder, Diatomita, diatomite, uh, which is a uh, ancient um, algae that existed in that territory, like a sort of like a plankton that existed in that territory of Peru when the desert of Nazca was below the ocean. So we were covered by the ocean once, millions, billions of years ago. Uh, and there was an alga, uh, a plankton in that location. And that plankton turned into this white powder that is called diatomita or diatomite, right? Uh, so, well, this plague is of a, a fusion of gold and copper mm -hmm. and, and has a really peculiar shape that is not really something that uh, we've have seen before or it has no, no similarity with other uh, decorative elements, right? So we are going to continue. Once again, the hands, 25% Homo sapiens DNA. Mm? So we continue seeing a small percentage of Homo sapiens DNA, but the rest, not con conclusive. It, it has not been done also be a bigger investigation of the rest of the DNA is what the official source, official, uh, let's say, channel that is investigating these mummies that has in their possession, still the mummies, and they were not able to keep investigating because uh, it, it must have been also a very long, complicated process. So, well, these are the, uh, sorry. Uh -huh. So in the case of these hands, there is a problem about the hands. The hands is just, um, there are some investigations that say that it is 19% Homo sapiens and other percentage says, other investigation says 100% Homo sapiens. Mm -hmm. So it means that 
one investigation was done with a section of the hands and another investigation from another section of the hands, right? And they gave different measures. Mm -hmm. Also, this is also interesting for you to know. Mm -hmm. Now we're going to the humanoids, the humanoids. This is Josefina, is one section of Josefina. Josefina is one of these little, like, sort of like small creatures of 60 centimeters height. And there is a, a section in Josefina, which is unique, and you will not see in the other, uh, say, creatures, which is a stomach that looks more roundish, right? And that indicates that there is a possibility of a pregnancy in this creature. So when the, the investigations were done in her, when the x-rays were done, they were discovered this. Hmm? So we have in the x-rays done in Josefina, these roundish elements, oh, that, of course, the first impression for the specialist was eggs. Oh, so many of these uh, scientists that were investigating the mummies, they were, uh, of course, pro the belief of, uh, sorry, pro the belief of that they were uh, alien origin. Uh, they were seen here, they proved that there was a reptilian connection no, between these aliens, you know, and, and uh, on their evolution, right? So uh, I wanted to, for you, have the chance of do a comparison. And that's why I took this picture, which is from a different thing. Rhonda is not the humanoid, it's not the humanoid. I took from internet a picture of a tortoise, exactly Rhonda, uh, and also a picture of the tortoise with eggs. Why? Because we have to do an evaluation. We are doing a scientific evaluation of these mummies too. And I wanted you to have the chance of see how an x-rays of x look like and how the x-rays here look like. Do you see similarities or do you find them different, my friends? What do you think? Hmm? The reason why I'm doing this analysis is because we can see, of course, these shapes here, right? But they, to me, look more solid. They look more compact. They have, of course, a rounded shape, right? But you can see that these X over here, they are transparent. We can see through them. And here we cannot see anything across them. So they must have been more compacted, right? So we are going later to try to understand why. I want you to have your conclusions. I just want also to give you the possibilities of doing questions, right? So we are going to evaluate this, okay? Maybe they weren't sure. Yes, Rhonda, maybe, of course, maybe. I will also go back to this picture before to explain why this could be happening. So this is a, a image of the X-ray from also a little bit more distance. Mm -hmm. And we have here also, and I have to now go to the explanation or to the versus, let's say, to the opinion of the scientists about this pregnancy in particular, right? So what the scientific say about this pregnancy, if it was one, is that it is, there are three points that are very strange for them here. First of all, the eggs are of different size and shape. 
in the case behind here, you can see that the X are pretty much all the same shape, right? But in the ones here, we don't see the same shape, right? The same size of shape. That's one of these points. The design is believed no, this is not a real, uh, let's say, creature, right? Also, another thing is the fact that when you do an X-ray of a X, the density of the shell of the X is not such for not permitting the X-rays to go across the X. Like, for example, here, can you see the spinal, the spine of the tortoise, right? You can still see it, and there's an egg here. But in this case, no. Same case over here, no. So they said this could not be an egg. They believe these were rocks. Hmm? So that this was a fabricated element. And another thing is the space or the canal or the, the, the site from, from where the eggs come out, it is too small, right? So this is the analysis of the uh, scientists about this. We're talking about, in this case, about the uh, small creatures, the ones of 60% high, okay? So here you have both opinions, okay, my friends? So... We have here also another element that called my attention in particular, which was this evident fracture in one section of the, of the uh, arm of this creature. When I was hearing the documentaries uh, uh, of the alien um, project, uh, they said that they believe this fracture was done when this person was alive or this creature was alive and that was probably the cause of the death of this creature. For the specialists that are not believing this idea, they believed that this was a proof of the fabrication of this creature, right? So we have a fight, we have a fight like hard between these two different groups. But uh, still we don't have DNA tests in the creatures, the small creatures, my friends. They are no in the official website of the alien project where I, I took all of this information. Uh, there's no DNA test yet and carbon-14 analysis yet. For the other, for the mummies, for Wawita, for the hands, for Maria, uh, the uh, carbon-14 estimates that these are mummies that lived about 1,000 years ago, more or less. Hmm? This is a recreation of how the little uh, creatures of 60 centimeters high look like probably if they uh, once were alive. Oh, so this is an artistic recreation in this section. Mm -hmm. uh, it recalls to me oh, the, the famous, um, there's a famous movie, uh, very famous. I, I don't know if you can, E.T., that's right, Rhonda. Exactly, exactly the same, uh, uh, say, recreation to me, right? Uh, really, really very similar. So we have over here, some uh, skulls, uh, it's the same, actually the same, uh, from different perspectives, uh, that uh, were the ones that helped the artist to recreate this artistic representation. And here we have also a, a investigation, a closer investigation to the skull. Here we are going to do something uh, very important in terms of uh, the analysis of the skulls of the little creatures, okay? Because I've done the same with the bigger ones, right? The, the full human size, Maria and Wawita. So we have to do the same with the little creatures, 
right? Uh, <laughs> Um, uh, Marilyn. Uh, so I want to also evaluate with you about these skulls. Uh, uh, to do this, by the way, I've seen lots of different documentaries, forensic uh, documentaries about the mummies. I am not a specialist, and I hope also you will be able to understand what I'm trying to evaluate with you, right? So uh, first of all, the, theor the theory uh, that uh, the archaeologists handle uh, or, or accept uh, or that the use, sorry, to say that this is a fabrication is that they say, first of all, that this skull, right, which is here, the X-ray, this, by the way, this skull is not one of the, the ones that are in the hands of the alien project. Okay, my friends, these are not the ones of the alien project. These are the ones that were, a, that came from the same source and were sold uh, to other collectors. And later those collectors agreed uh, uh, with uh, the Ministry of Culture to do these evaluations, right? So in, in the scientific world, uh, you know, that, that is also a, a form to test things uh, because they came from the same source okay uh, but of course the people from the alien project says that it is not the same okay it's not the same so it is you the one are going to judge right so here we have the skull look at this section my friends this is where the brain should be okay so there is something very interesting uh, the investigator said that the space where the brain is, is not separated from where the eyes, the mouth, the throat is. Everything is a big space, a big hole, right? So, for example, when this person or this entity eats, all the food goes inside here and mixes with all the rest that is inside this space. This is what they say that is impossible. There is no chance something like that could happen. Also, although here is where the eyes are, there is not a space for sort of like, like a, a socket or a hole for the eyes, right? So it's everything very superficial. So what they believe instead, because archaeologists want to give an explanation to this. I think this is very curious. They believe that this, in reality, was the back side of the head and the front was here. Uh, that this, for example, was where the, you know, the eyes are, this section over here, right? And this was the back. And where nowadays is the mouth is where used to be uh, the, the hole where the spine of an animal connects with the skull. Uh, that is in the in the quadrupeds, right? In like doggies, for example, or, or cats. Uh, so that connection of the spine goes in this part, right? So this is what they believe. So what are their theories? I've been also giving you the theories of the, uh, the, the people supporters of the alien origin of these mummies. Now let me tell you about these other theories. Uh, so they said, for example, that they were able to find a skin in the agujero magno. What is the agujero magno? Uh, let me explain what it is. The agujero magno is, sorry, I found it in Spanish, but maybe you can help me with the English. So it's the hole here in the, in the skull where the, um, with, when the spine gets into, you know, connects with the skull. So that hole here is the agujero magno, right? So they were able to find, doing the analysis of these little mummies, the ones, you know, not the ones of the alien project, but the ones that are very similar to those, that they found in this section skin. So, you know, skin in that zone is not possible uh, because the skin has to be outside, not inside the hole. Uh, there was no globular space for the eyes. Right. Uh, so these are the most interesting elements that they say, no way, Jose, this was not this is not real, they say. Right. And they attribute even, you know, this cause to 
uh, modified uh, animal skulls, right? They even say this was a work of taxidermist. No suture lines. Rhonda, ah, yes, exactly. Of course, yes. So that's also what we have in, in mummies, in, in, in indigenous mummies with mummified skull. This is the agujero magno that I was saying. And here you can see the skin uh, is too deep, too close into the hole. And also the hole of the agujero magno of this creature is not circular. It's sort of like square. So that's very strange. Also, they did some... Um, sort of like um, uh, comparisons with the skulls of these creatures, uh, of this creature that was in their uh, capacity. You can see also no suture uh, lines, right? Um, so they did a comparison with the creature that they had in their possession. Remember, these are not the same ones, exactly the same ones, like the one uh, of the uh, alien project, but they came from the same vendor, from the same the people that found the mummies, okay? So uh, here you can see one of the skulls, and these archaeologists compare them with the skulls of, this one is a cat, and this one is a dog, okay? So what they found was similarities. So they believe that where the agujero magno of the skull is, this is the back, this is the front, right? So they, um, the person that maliciously, they believe this was a malicious recreation, uh, they put a, a, a mouth here in that section. You will have to count, go with, to create your conclusions and, and finally say, no, I believe this or I don't believe in this. I want you to do that, please. Uh, so I'm just trying to put all the different positions. So here I have different perspectives of the same skull. Uh, and uh, to, to show you what is the, the, the belief uh, of these archaeologists, that they, they do find similarities. They find similarities. And this is the agujero magno of the creature, which I was saying has an, a strange a square shape. They believe that the actual one was here. And they, uh, someone moved it in this direction to create this shape of a creature mummy. Okay, so, uh, well, here we have also some close-ups uh, into the, the bones uh, of the hands. Hmm. And for the believers of, the, uh, of these creatures being really uh, alien, they believe that the lack of the thumb, you know, was not a problem for these people because the length of these fingers were big enough for grabbing anything. So I'm just trying to give you the, the perspective of the fingers completely closed and how they could hold things with those three fingers with no need on having a fifth one. Mm -hmm. But for the people who don't believe in this were real hands, that were, they were instead fabricated, let me tell you what are their opinions. Also prepare for this. There are two things that are very interesting. First of all, I'm trying to do a, a comparison between uh, regular feet, right? Even a regular hand here and the one of the mummy of Maria. So first, notice the shape of the feet up down to here is the same, right? Everything, the difference is here. So what is the point that archaeologists say, it, this is fabricated for sure? Why, why they hold on in this idea from seeing these uh, x-rays? Can you see this, my friends? Can you see this, right? This is a big space. Is that right? A big separation. Mm -hmm. They, archaeologists believe, this is not humanly impossible. This is not possible. Do you see such spaces here? Do you see spaces like that here? No, right? These spaces are too big. 
It's like the finger has no, the, sorry, the toes has no connection with the rest of the, of the feet, right? Here, there's nothing like that. Look at this. But they say that here, this is impossible. That there was a modification of the thing of the of the toes. But also, there's another more thing that they say, because in this section we have another big difference. Look at the length of the of the feet. So they said the following. They said that the feet, the uh, sorry, the bones of the hand, in particular this one here, this bone, was moved and added to the feet. Also, oh, here we can see also how the mummy, the, the feet of the mummy looks, right? So this bone, they said that came from the hands and it was moved to replace or to extend the feet. They even explained that the fact that one of the bones of the finger, of the toes have fallen is because this was a creation and because it was not soldered properly, it fell down, okay? So this is the explanation of the specialist, of the forensic archaeologist. And once again here, pie is feet. Mano is hand, so they believe that this bone here was taken from hand and put here. But there is something very curious. The, the people who believe in this being alien mummies, they said that how can you solder, you know, like uh, so well uh, fingers and, and, you know, or, or bones or pieces of, of you know, like, entire pieces of, of uh, fingers to feet on a dead person. Oh? So they said that that's not possible and there's, there's like no evident external uh, unions, right? So that's why many still believe this, of course, is not a fabrication. So here I'm offering you also other x-rays and comparisons with uh, other, other like regular hands hmm, and fingers. Hmm. If I have a doctor in the group, I would love to hear also to read the comments about this. Um, well, it, these are the best images I'm trying to share with you. Here we have a, a hand that's, this is the hand of Guawita, uh, in which uh, archaeologists explain that there is a clear mutilation of the finger uh, this is the little finger and the thumb, which will come here in this section also, is gone. Mm. The diatomite is located everywhere in the, in, the, in the territory of Nazca. This was probably the source of the mummification of the mummies, the original mummification of the mummies. Nowadays, the diatomite is used as a pesticide. And it's a really good preservative of the skin because uh, as a natural pesticide, um, these sort of, the, sort of like crystals, there are microscopic crystals, the ones that conform this, this dirt, um, they penetrate into the skin of the insects and are very abrasive. So they eventually kill the uh, insects. Uh, so it's not like a, like a poison, but it, it hurts the insects. So that's why it's so good pesticide also. Mm -hmm. So the scientific conclusions are that uh, after the investigation and that I'm trying to show you, is that these are fabricated mummies. Of course, it's not a surprise, my friends. Uh, we're talking about aliens and we're talking about you know archaeologists and scientists they don't match really well usually but it's important to know that there are also a very very few very small group but there are some archaeologists that are supportive of uh, the, uh, the the idea that these are truly alien mummies and i think these mysteries 
which keep alive also the story of, of, of Peru, the pre-Hispanic story, and also there are so many other mysteries uh, have to be shared. Um, but uh, also, to come to the, to the last part of this event, it's important to know what is the opinion of the government about this because you know the scientifics don't really buy this story right um the government is completely against it uh, <laughs> gracias sayuri <laughs> uh, my, my friend sayuri which is my colleague here in hago is sharing also my link tree uh, if you want to also uh, follow my upcoming tours and and come to another series of these mysteries of peru please join me join my tours i have a facebook group so please you're welcome you i hope you are having a fun time because that's the idea we we are uh, trying to share this to learn something new uh, relax uh, and also you know get into this mysterious life Gracias, Ayuri, amiga. Gracias, gracias. Gracias, Marilyn. Thanks for your tip support. Thank you so much. There is something really interesting that happens in this. Uh, this is one of the last um, slides, I promise. Um, in the investigation done in the group of mummies that was, once again, not the one in possession of the university, not the one of the alien project, because we are not able to access those. We cannot do that. Uh, there are also some uh, investigations published, but I'm sure not all of them are published in the website. This investigation here is from all the group of mummies, right, that uh, were in the possession of other collectors that are similar to those mummies, in which was discovered the following. You can read this, right, my friends? Glue, paper, you know. <laughs> So we are talking about modern, modern materials. Hmm? So um, they were discovered in some of the other mummies, these elements, which for the archaeologists reinforce the idea of a fabrication. And that's why many archaeologists stand up um, in, in 2000. 18, especially when the Discovery, sorry, the History Channel uh, created this uh, big documentary, is against, uh, standing against uh, this, this, uh, uh, let's say, uh, sort of like propaganda, no, to protect the mummies. They said no, no, this, this should not be possible. Uh, people that were involved in, in this in this case, they should go to jail. Uh, they should, you know, like pay um, for the damage of the patrimony and the mummies and and all of that. So this is why the mummies in this moment are in the hands of a university, and in this moment, nobody really can access to those mummies. But what the people of Nazca think, amigos? We have to talk about also the, the, every, the, the common people, the people of Nazca. They believe Mario, the person oh, who found the mummies, or, you know, for, under the perspective of the archaeology, is the creator of the mummies because they believe he fabricated them. Or they believe he was the great discoverer of the mummies. And also one of his helpers, uh, Kravix, which is the one who sold the other mummies that were uh, used by the uh, scientists to investigate the ones against the idea uh, that these were alien mummies. What they believe about them? People from Nazca, most of them believe in the origin, the alien origin of these mummies. And they even want to create a museum about the alien mummies. Uh, they, the community, believe in the aliens. They believe in the contacts with the aliens. So that is why um, they are protectors of Mario. They protect uh, the, the people who are here trying to take care of the mummies. And that's why uh, they, they, they find also big support, right? So, uh, and we have to, of course, understand all the positions. We're trying to be here today. Uh, open-minded about this story. Here I give you uh, the website of the Instituto Incarri.com N for English, if you want to read all the information in English, and the Alien Project in English as well, right? So please visit these uh, links. 
Uh, I'm sure you're going to find lots of uh, interesting information that will take you also to other um, other themes, other topics. Very soon, I'm going to come again with another story. <laughs> we have to be enough. To... Oh, yes, of course, Adrian. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you for, for visiting uh, me again here in Lima. Uh, here you have all my links. Uh, give me a follow. In the upper part, there is a, a, a button for following this channel. And soon I'm going to be doing... A, an event about archaeology, also from home, that is going to be about the Inca who discovered Oceania, the first one who traveled to the islands of the Pacific. We're going to understand if there was any connection between the Easter Island and the Incas of Peru. So this is coming very soon. I hope you join me also in that occasion. Thank you so much for your participation. This event extended more, but I hope you enjoy it. And also, um, well, to have your company in another occasion very soon. If you would like to support this channel also with a tip, uh, if you would like to support Hago also uh, uh, and this project of free events and free uh, lectures and tours, um, and is, is in your possibility, uh, let me activate a button. Uh, that will conduct you into a, a, a little, you know, like a, a section where you're going to be informed about how to donate. Uh, any amount is, of course, a highly appreciated. Thank you so much. Gracias, Molly. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's always a pleasure to spend my evenings, my days with you uh, and see you very, very soon. Muchas gracias. Have a lovely weekend. Have a lovely Saturday, Sunday uh, and best to you all, by the way. So, muchas gracias, amigos. Take care. Uh, see you soon. Gracias, gracias. Thank you, Marilyn. Oh, gracias. Thank you. You are always welcome here. Gracias, Mark. Thank you, Rhonda. Gracias. Thanks for your questions. Thanks for your participation. Muchas gracias. See you. Bye-bye.